Okay, Advent of Code 2023, day three, in two and a half minutes. Woo, it's coming up soon. All right, let's get ready by copying and pasting day three tests and tests mod day three and might as well start off a new file called day three dot rs paste stuff there um we'll just print we'll just return zero for now main day three i'm actually starting on time today okay no idea what the input will be but it is going to be day three okay what to expect no idea well let's make our test pass at least it's a good for a good omen right so what is having a code? Well, it's going to start in a minute, but it is a series of puzzles, problem solving puzzles to every day from December 1st to December 25th. They are Christmas themed. They're made by Eric Wassel and you can solve them in any programming language, but generally you can't do them by hand. You need a computer to solve them. So in about 40 seconds, that's going to unlock. Get the Stripe Monkey. Yes, good luck, Stripe Monkey. Stripe Monkey is probably also going to be doing day three. So in 30 seconds, this unlocks and we can read it. So it's going to be a Christmas-themed problem to be solved where we have to write a program to get usually a numerical output. And it's usually a whimsical, whimsically-themed excuse to solve some kind of problem. So... Here we go. Without further ado, in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and we can click on it. You and the elf eventually reach a gondola lift station. He says the gondola lift will take you up to the water source, but this is as far as he can bring you. You go inside. It doesn't take long to find the gondolas, but there seems to be a problem. They're not moving. Ah! You turn around to see a slightly greasy elf with a wrench and a look of surprise. Sorry, I wasn't expecting anyone. The gondola lift isn't working right now. It'll still be a while before I can fix it. You offer to help. The engineer explains that an engine part seems to be missing from the engine, but nobody can figure out which one. If you can add up all the part numbers in the engine schematic, it should be easy to work out which part is missing. The engine schematic, your puzzle input, consists of a visual representation of the engine. There are lots of numbers and symbols you don't really understand, but apparently any number adjacent to a symbol, even diagonally, is a part number and should be included in your sum. Periods do not count as a symbol. Here is an example of an engine schematic. So in this schematic, two numbers are not part numbers because they are not adjacent to a symbol. 114 and 58 right here, not adjacent. Every other number is adjacent to a symbol and so is a part number. So, I'm guessing it's 467, 35, 633, 617, 592, 755, 644, and 598. And their sum is 4,361. So, we're going to take that is our expected output for our test, which is this. Pasting it there. Okay, so the way I am thinking about this is as we are reading the lines in, we're going to want to put it into some structure that we can then randomly access because when we get to something like, I don't, I don't know, 592, we're going to want to look at all of the um, positions around it and see if any of them are symbols, right? And I'm guessing that to identify a number, we'll just 
to, we'll just break it up by things that aren't digits. And um, that gives us um, strings that we can then break, um, figure out what, um, what the numbers are. Uh, so let's, let's at least first start by doing, um, uh, the, uh, parsing. So, uh, we're going to get a grid, right? Grid equals, um, grid new from the input. We're going to have some kind of grid. So struct grid, um, impul grid. Ah, see, my clumsiness in the keyboard is going to screw me. So function new um, input. Self. Okay, what's in the grid? I think fundamentally it's just a two-dimensional vector of characters to start with. So, um, uh, cares is going to be a vector of vectors of care. So, uh, we should probably build this by collecting. So. We're going to return a self. Uh, I guess we can build the characters independently. Cares equals the input. Um, we have we have the lines for input, right? And then we're going to map each line to the lines characters, right? So, uh, can I just do um, str cares and then um, collect that? Um, and then collect on the inside. Hold on, let me think about this. Uh, I want to actually take the line and do the line dot cares and then collect internally. Okay, so let's keep that to do because we are not done yet. But that should give me hmm. Our data escapes. Okay, so we have to do um copied to make a copy of e of them. Um, it yields care. Is it because it doesn't know what collect is? Um, that's an iterator. Copied. Wait. Hold on. I need to see the types here. Uh, let x equals this. What's the type of x? Cares of something. Okay, uh, go back. What if I do cares copied? Copied cares. What's the problem here? Expected cares to be entered that yields a reference, but it yields a character. Why is it expected? So expected associated type. Maybe I need to look and see what the how cares is defined. I, Item, oh, item is a character. So then I don't, shouldn't need to do a copied. So. Let's 
it's a vector of characters. So what's the deal? Borrow data escapes. Why does it say it escapes? I don't see how it could escape. It's static. Oh, this has to be static. Okay, that's the whole that's the whole th problem. Okay, so uh, that's gonna cost me a little bit of time. That's okay. All right, we got the characters out. So we got the grid out. So I think in addition to collecting it into characters, I think we also want to find out what where the what numbers there are and where the, where they are in the grid. So let's have um another structure, which is um, a uh, number in grid. And so it'll be the number, which is U32, and it'll be the position, which will be, um, how about just X, U size and Y, just for, just to be easy, just to make it easy. And so we're gonna have um, numbers, which is a, a vector, of number in grid. Okay, and so for this, I think what I wanna do is every line, we're going to split using a pattern of not number, and then for every, um, well, I guess we could just scan. That might be the easiest way. Scan from left to right, find the positions, and lengths of numbers and um, parse them in. Just to make it easy, let's have the width also because the X plus the width will be the right side of the number and X will be the left side of the number. So let numbers equal um, again, we're going to do input, the lines input, and map a line. Uh, let's make a function for this. So, um, uh, so we're going to turn the iterator of lines into an iterator of We're going to turn each line into an iterator of numbering grids, and then we're going to flatten it all. So we're going to call something that gives us an iterator, and then we're going to flatten, I think. Although, hold on, I, I'm going to want to do an enumerate on this. Because then we're getting um, a Y and a line, right? Because that Y has to go back into numbering grid there. So um, this is like parse numbers in grid Y and line. And then assuming that that gives us an iterator of iterators, we should be able to flatten and then collect to put up the numbers there. So I just need to have um, a parse numbers in grid function to do this part. Function parse numbers in grid. It's given a y, which is a u size, and a line, which is a static string. And it's going to give us um, some iterator where the item is a um, number in grid. Make sure this compiles. Let's do a to-do there. Make sure. Okay, so it just doesn't know what the type is. So um, to get a type for this, I think I want to do, um, we're going to turn like the line cares, care indices maybe? 
because then we can then filter out all the ones that aren't the first c character. And um, yeah, what does care indices give me? Uh, index, I guess, into the slice and then the, and then the actual character. Okay, so um, can I use that? Actually thinking it might be easier not to make an iterator here, but to make a collection that we then, so if we had a collection, um, so like numbers is a vector new, and then we simply did numbers into iter, that satisfies this, should satisfy that, and everything compiles. Hey there, Anakin Luke. Yeah, we're solving day three of admin code 2023 and i'm going to be pretty slow i'm not competing for the leaderboard but of course doing things in rust because that's what i like doing so um we're trying to find where the numbers are in our input here so i'm for each line what i'm thinking about doing is um scanning from left to right and we'll have like i think we'll just do it with a state machine so we remember like if we're if we found a number yet and if we have not if we have or we have not we're if we have if we have found a number then we're looking for the end of the number to know how long the number is if we have not found a number we're looking for a number so um because i kind of like state machines even though i kind of get in trouble with them um I'm gonna to try to try to use one here. Actually, what if, can I make one internally to the function? That would be ideal. I think I'm allowed to do this, right? State. Um, and then the states are um, look um, no number number, and then we'll have um, the 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 index of the first character. And I think that's it, right? Right, and then um, I think what I'll do is I'll just have um, an implementation of state which um, pushes the next index and character in and then produces two things out, the, the next state and then what, and then if it, got, if, it, if it got a number, what it is. So this will be a function um, next and it gets a state in, so that's a self. And it also gets in a, two things, a, 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 a position and a character. And it's gonna yield two things out. It's gonna have um, the next state and then optional uh, this type, number in digit. So we might have a number in digit. Oh, we also have to know um, what the Y is, right? To do. Okay. So, given that, I think what we do is we say um, numbers is a new vector, right? So, then we'll first start let um mute actually i guess we can just um we can do a fold on all the characters in the line so line dot care indices dot fold and the initial is state no number the function gets the state and it gets the next um thing which is whatever item is so it's one of these uh do i get it as a tuple i don't think i do i think i think they are not in a tuple so it's like this so um i have to give these names actually so this is position and this is x um, positions x the character is c so we're supposed to produce the next state, right? So 
we're, what, we're, what we need to do is we need to match the state. So match state. And then we'll fill in all of the things. Actually, I'm going to do a match a state with the character. Uh, how about matching the state with whether or not the character is numeric? That's probably more interesting, right? So now, fill match arms, we have whether or not it's the next character is a number and whether or not we're currently any number. So this, we need to give it a name, right? Um, this is start. So this one's easy. This is state no number. Um, this one's also easy. This one's um, state number start. And here are the two that are not easy. So if we're, we don't, haven't found a number yet and we hit a numeric, then that is X. If we were parsing a number and we hit that we're, we hit something that's not a number, then we want to do two things. We want to have a side effect. Ultimately, we're going to go back to the no number state. We're also going to push back into the numbers. So this needs to be mutable. Uh, numbers dot push a um, number in grid. The number we got to parse out though. Uh, X is the beginning, so that's start. The width is going to be X minus start. Y is Y. And because Y is given way up here. And then the number is going to be, I have to take a slice out of the line um, from X to, actually, why don't I just get the length, the width, let width. Actually, that's not how it works, right? If I do a slice, it's X, X to, it start to X. Um, and then parse that, right? And unwrap that. So that gives me the number. Okay. That's fine, except for if we get to the very end of this. Um, so this will be the in the last state. So um, end, let state equal that, right? We get to the end. If let state, if it was in the middle of parsing a number, at the very edge of the screen. Then we have to um, push an additional one in there, right? Where we go all the way to the end. So the X in this case is the the width. So um, I guess we can just get it here, right? Um, let X equal um, line dot length. Actually, it's the number of characters, right? No, it's not the number of characters. It really, I think this care indices gives me actual in indices. So I want the index of the end, which is going to be the length. Okay, cool. So, uh, I want to actually see if I'm parsing this correctly. So what I'm going to do is going to put a debug on this. See if we got at least this correct. And I can't do that. Uh, how do I? Oh, I can if I implement, derive, if I derive debug from here, right? And then I have to derive debug on that too for that to work. Okay, so then let me close a few things, run this test and see if in the debugger. Okay, it's kind of hard to read. So there's our grid, right? And here are our numbers. It looks like it's working, right? 467, 114. The widths are, are correct. 35, 3, 633, 617. Yep. There, okay. There's a, okay. We did the parsing correctly. 
So then the final thing is we got to do a scan around the number to see if it has any symbols. So let's do that. Um, I can make that a property of the grid, I think. So ultimately, what should um, part one do? After it gets the grid, we want to say, take the numbers. So, so it's the grids numbers in iter. And then we want to filter map um, the number in grid um, to just it's the number inside of it and then filter it out if it is not a part number if it is a part number i think we add them right yeah so then then we sum them and that is the answer so this will be um if grid dot is part is that the way yeah is part number and we're just going to pass it the number in grid then it's sum number in grid dot number else it's none okay so we need to have a method called is part number um yeah is part number on grid so grid has a new now it's going to have a function is part number uh, self and then we're going to have a um, num um, number in grid. Number in grid. Okay, so we need to go all the way around the thing. So I think the easiest thing would be to take the whole block of um, three rows and um, all the columns starting one to the left of the number and ending one to the right of the number and just see if any of them are, are symbols. Uh, basically anything that's not a, a number or a dot. And if we see any anything there, then we return true. And only if we scan them, we never see them, then it's false. So um, we have to be careful though, because when we're on the edge, we don't want to underflow. If we're on the left edge, we don't want to underflow going left either. So let's compute like the 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 rectangle we're going to scan. So that's like from from the the y, the y minimum to y maximum. So what let's do y zero is the minimum. That's going to be um, that's going to be number in grid dot y. And if it's, hmm, I don't know if this is the easier way to say this, but if I could, but if I say like, hey, did not shade, dude, haven't completed day two, so you don't want spoilers. Okay, I will not give you spoilers. We're on day three though now. If y zero is greater than zero, y zero minus equal one. All right, and then we're gonna have this a similar thing for if um how do I say this? If it's at the bottom row, we don't want to go down one. So if it's if y one plus one is less than uh, self dot cares dot length. Then y one can we can add one to it. Okay. Um, why does it? Oh, not done yet. So to do that. Oh, there's a saturating subtraction. Okay, perfect. We can do a saturating subtraction. 
and we don't need to do so I can't do a saturating add here but I could do a minimum right I could do and what I can do is I can take the length and do a min of that plus one Uh, but then I have to subtract one, right? So maybe it's easier to read if I just do it this way. Okay, and then I got to do the same thing for the X as well. So... X zero is... Um, number grid X saturating subtract one and then it's, uh, I guess we can just take cares zero length. Mm, it's only complaining because I got rid of the to do at the end. Okay, so then we're gonna scan all the, all the way through. So four y in x zero, all the way including x one or actually why am i doing x it's y to y1 for x in x0 x1 if we get out of here then we haven't seen a symbol will return false if we uh let's just false then if we do see a symbol in here so symbols it's not numeric and it's not a dot so if so let's let the c equal self dot cares y x this is assuming that the characters are ascii which i think is safe um or otherwise i'd have to do a care indices and then walk to y spaces to get the index for the character but i'm not going to bother with that um if c is numeric actually we're going to say if it's not numeric and actually what if I put it here C if C is not equal to can't type right now why not dot and it's not numeric return true all right so then back to the part one so yeah so that's we're done right so I can just run this and see if the test passes and it failed. We got a different number. We got 2021. So let's try to find out uh, which ones it thought were part numbers. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, oh, we have a to do here. Hold on. Um, what? It never called next? Wait, what the heck did I do? Oh, I had next all prepared and I ended up doing next in outside here. Uh, okay, well, I'll fix that up later. This, this ugly stuff here is supposed to go into this next function. Uh, but that's okay. Um, I ended up doing a fold anyway, so it didn't it didn't matter. I guess I can just get rid of that then. Uh, but that's not the problem. So where was the debug that I left in there? There it is. Let's get rid of that and um, it's on the part one on the filter map. I think I want to um, put a DBG here. And then this should tell me which ones it thinks are parts. 35. Okay, it didn't think 467 was though. I, th I think it, oh, we need to go one to the right of it. I need to add one more. That's the problem. Okay, um, let's do that. Parting, where is it here? I need to add two to it, 
right? Actually, I want to not just add two. I want to add its um, its x plus number in grid width. So if it's three, one, two, then I don't need to add one then, because it's if it's if it's if it's on zero when we add three, one, two, three, or we're already a one to the right of it, so I don't need to do that. Uh, I do need to make it go the I need to make it go back one though. If so if if it's greater than or equal to, we need to subtract one. Yeah, a little boundary boundary check there. Okay, cool. So that worked. And then just so I can get my answer quicker, I'm ready to run this. I'm just going to copy paste here and change the two to a three. I need to get my day three input. Here it is. Uh, I need to make a new file for day three input, paste it, and then uh, why is this not like me? Oh, because I don't have, um, because I didn't have day three input to begin with. Okay, so cargo run day three, part one. Here's our number. Copy. Close that. Paste. Submit. Yay. All right. Um... I do kind of want to get rid of the debug really quick. Although it's costing me precious seconds. Not that I'm competing. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Moving on to part two. The engineer finds the missing part and installs it in the engine. As the engine springs to life, you jump in the closest gondola, finally ready to ascend to the water source. You don't seem to be going very fast, though. Maybe something is still wrong. Fortunately, the gondola has a phone labeled help. So you pick it up and the engineer answers. Before you can explain the situation, she suggests that you look out the window. There stands the engineer, holding a phone in one hand and waving with the other. Hi! You're going so slowly that you haven't even left the station. You exit the gondola. The missing part wasn't the only issue. One of the gears in the engine is wrong. A gear is any star symbol that is adjacent to exactly two part numbers. Its gear ratio is the result of multiplying those two numbers together. This time, you need to find the gear ratio of every gear and add them all up so that the engineer can figure out which gear needs to be replaced. Okay, so consider the same schematic. So the gear ratio is 467 times 35, right? And the second gear is down here. It's 755 times 598. That's that. The star addition to 617 is not a gear because it only has one number adjacent, right? So adding up these two gears... Okay, cool. Well, that's not so hard. Let's see um, how much work it's going to be for me, though. So that's our number that we want to get. It's the same input, right? So let's go to part two. So what we want is um, we want to find um, every gear or every asterisk and see and basically scan around it to see um, if there are, well we want to see how for every asterisk we want to see find all the numbers that are adjacent to it and that there are um, I guess there are going to be either zero one or two I, I didn't talk about what if there are three of them what if there are three? Oh, no, exactly two. So if there are three, then we ignore it. If there's three or more, we ignore it. One or less, we ignore it. But if there's exactly two numbers, we multiply them. So we're going to then, so we're going to be asking um, this thing for the gears. And it's going to give me give us an iterator, right? So then we are going to want to uh, multiply them. A product, right? So gears needs to be um, something that uh, on self 
that returns us some iterator where the item is a number. Okay, and then, so, how do we get that? Well, why don't we just iterate all characters in the grid and filter out and just find the asterisks. So that's gears dot, or that's self dot um, cares dot iter um, dot um, map line to line iter. Oh, well, actually, we also need to, um, we also need to be counting. So I need to enumerate. So we're mapping the Y and the line to line dot It should just be cares again, right? No, it's, it is itself a vector. So it should be iter enumerate again. And then map that to X, Y, and then, and it's not a line anymore. It's a character. and then flatten that. That's going to be our, um, so let's just, that's going to give us all our asterisks. Let's just say I map just to make sure the types are correct. We should get a big tuple out, right? If I just map it all to zero, Uh, okay, I didn't quite get it right because that is not a tuple. And this also needs to be a tuple there. Okay, what's wrong with this? Um, didn't, what? What? Hidden type for captures light time doesn't appear in bounds. What? Oh, um, yeah, I guess we just put up implicit, um, borrow and that. Okay. What's wrong with this? Um, what's outliving borrows Y. Oh, is Y a reference? No, why is the size? Hold on, what? If I can move it because it'll just copy it, right? Yeah, okay. So it's just going to complain about this. I can do a flat map. Okay, cool. So, um, we just speak, we, we, now we have the enumeration context we want. So, um, given that I think, should I just brute force it? I should, I, I'll just look through all the numbers and see if we're next to, we'll just count the numbers that were next to it. So let, um, Yeah, we'll just we'll just collect all the numbers that we're next to, and then if it's exactly two, then we'll produce the um, gear ratio. So let um, nearby or adjacent numbers is uh, self dot numbers dot iter dot filter, uh, filter map, right? 
we'll filter and then we're going to want to um actually it can it can just be a filter map because we'll just get the numbers out and we'll 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 take their product if there are exactly two of them so filter map um number in grid if adjacent well, actually we're going to collect them right collect uh, I guess we have to give a data structure so we'll just do a vector okay if adjacent numbers dot length equals two then it's sum adjacent numbers dot into iterator into iterator dot product else none so yeah then it means we're doing a filter map and that's all I need to do right so when um, let's just keep, to keep it easy right now we'll just say it's always some number um, in grid dot number just to make sure it compiles and the number is going to be totally wrong but I just want to see if it works it does something okay so it produced um, the number one that's interesting why is it only one should have been a huge number Um, because we didn't use X, Y, and, and C. Yeah, hold on. Um, can I do like a DBG here? Oh, we're not going to run into any of them, right? Because it's going to be like, yeah, it's going to be a terrible number. Okay, so hold on. Um, product is one if there's no other numbers, right? So, okay, then that's, yeah, so it's never two. But what if we do it, if we do a DBG here, this should always be like, this the number the total number of numbers <laughs> yeah 10 for every position okay cool um then getting somewhere right so we just want to ask it if number in grid um, adjacent X and Y I don't need the character actually uh, can I get oh actually uh, hold on I only want to do it if it's a uh, so if it's if C is not equal to a gear then it's return none Right. That's um, dereference. Okay. So if it's adjacent to the gear, then we include its number. So now we just need to implement adjacent on number in grid. So impl number in grid. function adjacent self x u size y u size cool okay so it's if um x is not equal to um self dot x 
it has to be um adjacent means that it's it's within that same rectangle but not in the number itself right actually i guess i guess we could just do the same kind of check so what if like this kind of this kind of stuff we moved into a, a function here function um bounds returns like um through four u sizes right and that's um y0 y1 x0 x1 cuz i can reuse that in adjacent it's basically is it within this rectangle so um here we're just going to say let this equal um number in grid bounds and then i don't need any of this stuff Uh, this arrow shouldn't be be there. Um, this is self. Oh, we need um, another like width and height. So this is uh, height. And this is width. Okay, and then this we haven't written yet and this width is self cares lane and that's the height actually the width is this okay so some something triggered my dog barking so I'll be right back Yeah, I have a dog that triggers on the slightest sound, and the only way to get her to stop barking is to show her that there's no one at the door. <laughs> okay, uh, where was I? Uh, this is probably telling me that this could be a flat map, right? Okay, and then, um, right, adjacent. So, let uh, we already have those bounds, right? Bounds, 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 bounds. This. I already know one problem is that we're going to need to know this width and height again. Right there. So this is self. Width and height. Which means that this needs to also know the width and height. Um, it's sort of gross, but I think I will, um, copy and paste. That's the width, right? And width and height goes here. All right, and where's the error? Why is this an error? Um, we can move that. Yeah, we can. All right, so then it's adjacent. Basically, if it's within it, if x if y is less than y is zero, or y is greater than y one or x is less than x0, or x is greater than, um, actually, I just realized I need to invert all of that. 
So it has to be greater than or equal. These all these ors all have to be ands. Not all of them, just those ones. And uh, that has to be a less than or equal. Yes, less than or equal to. Greater than or equal to. Less than or equal to. That's the definition of adjacent. Okay. Now, I don't care if it's inside. It doesn't really matter because it won't be a star. All right. So, I don't know. Do I just want to go for it? And it failed. Attempt to multiply with overflow. Okay. So, got too big. Let's first see, like, for every position, um, let's do a debug on this. Again, I had that before. Two, one, and two. Okay, so then uh, let's see the X and the Y while we're at it. Actually, I can just move the D, B, G here, right? To um, X and Y. And get rid of this. Okay. Run. 7, 1, and 9, 8. So that's 7. Wait, 7? It's easier to see here. X is 7. One, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's not correct. That that's not right at all. So the outer loop is the y's, right? And then the, that means the inner loop is the x's. What if I do a DVG up here? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What? No, ro row one. It says column seven, but it's that's not column seven. That's column zero, one. That's column three. Seven. And why is it hitting it? It's okay. It's the Y is one, and then Y is four. Zero, one, two, three, four. Okay. It's seeing those two stars, but it thinks that that's column seven. Ah, why does it say it's seven? That should be three, not seven. I don't know why it says seven. I'm missing something. Oh, I am missing something. Shoot. That's indented. <laughs> okay. I um I didn't mean to run that. Um I didn't um trim the input. That's a problem. I need I need should I should fix that. But yeah. Um we're still getting an overflow, but it's correct now. So row one column three and then column three row four and the column five row eight two three four five six seven eight yeah okay well let me fix the first problem that i had i don't really need to fix it but i'm gonna do it anyway um the uh grid new this should have done um a line dot trim Um, this also needs to do uh, in here. This has to do a trim also. Cut 
because it gets character indices. So now um, I should be able to like outdent that and it still should give me the correct column numbers. Uh, oops, maybe not. <laughs> Panicked. Okay. Oh, because line, okay, line is in two places. Okay, so we need to pre-trim line before it comes out of here. Right there. Line.trim. Okay, so now it doesn't matter if there's white space at the beginning, uh, it trims it off, but I didn't want to see that there anyway. Um, actually, do I, I might have trimmed unnecessarily. Well, it's fine. Okay, so um, still have the overflow and multiply, so I guess I'm not doing the product correctly. So let's get rid of this. So there are two of them, right? We're getting a pro. We're getting a. If I put a DBG here, sixteen three forty five. That is indeed what we're supposed to get. And then the second one was four five one four nine zero. That is correct. And then it did an attempt to multiply with overflow for when it multiplied those two numbers together. Oh, wait. Did I do a product of products? We're supposed to add them. That might be the it. Um, the gears, yeah, we're supposed to add them. Why is there a plus thing? Okay, anyway. Ah. Okay, cool. We got we got the right answer. It succeeded. So I'm going to remove the DBG because it's just going to make the output like really crazy. And then run it again. Okay, so then in the main, Turn the one into a two for this one. And then run, uh, close that one, run part two. We got this huge number. Copy, paste, submit. Yes, we did it. So you see how well we did? We did almost exactly an hour, an hour and, uh, and 35 seconds or so. Uh, how do I see my stats again? I want to see my stats. That's that's global stats. How do I see my own? Do I need to go to day three? We make this so counterintuitive. Which one of these is it again? Is it leaderboard? Day three? Wow, that's crazy. Someone did both stars in, within five minutes. Leaderboard personal stats, yeah. Thank you. Uh, personal times. Okay. Should I say that if I get within 10,000 that I should feel okay but with myself? <laughs> See, we, I didn't start on time yes, yesterday. I was like 15 minutes late, right? So that cost me a lot. So this is, so I guess this is what I should expect for the rest of the month is to rank within the three to 4,000, three to 5,000 range. Okay, so if I go, um, where was it again? Leaderboard, private leaderboard. Let's see how we're doing on my, my leaderboard. Oh, Betseg hasn't 
finished yet. So, how about Primogen's leaderboard? Ooh, I jumped up to second place. Cooper user beat me, is still beating me though. How about on Endorns? T Bot T still beating me. I that's to be expected. T Bot T is a lot better at this than I am. Cool. I topped this leaderboard. I forget which streamer that is. Okay. I'm second place to this other person. Uh Danaka has gotten part one, but not part two yet. Cool. All right. I'm happy. So this is one cool thing about the contest. As we go from day to day, we start to see what um, what the uh, main page fills out to be. It's kind of like drawing our route through from the beginning where we got launched into the air and now we're in the clouds and now we're going up a gondola. And at the end, we get like a nice picture that of our journey. Um, let me clean up and then and then maybe we'll critique and improve. So cl let's close everything. Um, let's start with the tests, I guess. Actually, the tests are kind of boring, right? Yeah, close the tests. Solution. I didn't have any warnings, right? No warnings. I'm surprised. I would have thought that going so feverishly fast, I would have had warnings. To know how people do these things under six minutes. Um... I talked yesterday about my guesses. Now, my guesses are as good as yours, but what I think is in order to get onto this leaderboard at all these days, you have to have several dozen proto solutions ready before you even know what the puzzle is. And the moment it unlocks, you go immediately down to the bottom and you see, you just look at the example input, and then that narrows down which subset of your proto solutions are you going to try. Or maybe you just run all of them. You bas basically, you have to grab this and this as fast as you can and put them into your already prepared proto solutions, like your, your guesses. And then you, you, you just drop immediately all of the all the proto solutions that can't parse the input at all. And the ones that can, that can make some guess about it, that, oh, um, the subset of proto problems or proto solutions that know how to deal with a grid with numbers in it and symbols. Like, if you were lucky enough to have one, now you have all the code that can parse the grid and parse the symbols out already prepared for you within the first minute, right? So that gives you a huge lead. Then all you need to do is kind of like, take that initial guess about what the problem is going to be and then just tweak it to get the. So in this case, the tweaking is saying, oh, well, um, we just want to know, what was the first part? The first part was uh, we just want to know um, what the sum is for um, anything adjacent to a symbol, right? So um, you would just... You, the filtering of, you filter out the numbers that don't have symbols around them. Now, maybe that takes you a little bit of time because you didn't anticipate having to scan around the, around the number for a symbol. Or maybe you had, like, that code handy, and then you just plug that code in, and now you have part one done within the first five minutes. So, yeah, I think the only way to get on the leaderboard really is to have pieces of the solution already prepared and ready to go. So like, if we just spent like months just designing like all the different kind, like just going back to all the old advents of code, of advent of code puzzles, and, and just like categorizing them and taking and saying, well, a lot of the problems have to do with parsing the input into a grid. A lot of them have to do with extracting numbers out. Um, a lot of them have to do with like, doing spatial like scanning around something. And we, if we just like make little code snippets that we can mix and match, um, that's how, that's the only chance we'd have to get on the leaderboard is to have the code already written 
and just mix and match them to fit the problem. Um, I think the exception is this person who on day one got it in 12 seconds. I think that's an AI thing because they didn't do part two at all. And I don't think it's humanly possible to read the problem. Even if you skip to the end and grabbed the your input, and even if you had code ready, I don't think it's possible to do all that in 12 seconds. So I think they cheated. 35 seconds, I think it's pushing it. Um, these all I think are legit because they're donating to the project. So like, why would they cheat? You know, I don't know. But it still is insane that, that someone can do this in like so little time. Wow, three minutes. So how long did it take me? 34 minutes. Maybe they're just brute force guessing the answer for thousands of accounts. Problem is if you brute force it, there's a exponential back off of wait time that it imposes on you. If you get a wrong answer, you have to then wait a minute and then you have to wait two minutes and then you have to wait four minutes. So you can only guess a few certain number of times before you, um, you're out of the running. Top solvers reading comprehension exp I think they just don't read it. I think I think they jump to the end. And there is a little bit of hinting that goes on with the problems. You see all the ones that are highlighted? Like you could just I think I think if you just focus on the highlighted words. Those are like hints about um the rules of the of the of the problem. And then you can just disregard, like you don't probably don't have to read this one at all. And you don't have to read this, pro you don't have to read any of this text at all. So you might read, you might read this first paragraph really quick because it has water source in it. And then you'd be like, ah, oh, that was just throwing me off. And then you skip immediately to this paragraph because it has add up all the part numbers. And then probably the only thing you get out of it is I need to, to do an ad, right? The end of it has to be an ad. And then number adjacent to a symbol means I, I need to pick my code snippets that do scanning for adjacency in, in a spatial map, right? So I think that's that's how you do this as a speed coder. You focus on the highlighted text only, skip all of the paragraphs that have no highlighted text, and then you'd work you'd work your way from that. The golf version of ASC would be fun. So like smallest program possible. Some people do that says anonymous, so maybe that means they aren't signed in and can bypass the timeout. Um, I don't think you're allowed to post an answer that gets you on the leaderboard without being signed in. I think anonymous is when you, when you sign in, you can appear as anonymous. So you can either appear as your name from whatever you authenticated with or like your GitHub link or anonymous. But, um, you know, some, someone legit, I hope Eric goes after, or at least like looks into like, like yeah, maybe it was a fluke. Maybe, maybe they got a puzzle input because everyone gets different puzzle inputs. Maybe they got, got a puzzle input that was kind of like a lucky guess or something. Anyway, um, I have a feeling that I could clean this up a bit. Adjacent is sort of a weak word because this really isn't an adjacency test. It's it's um it's a it's a hit test around um whether we're within one character of the number in the grid. Uh, I like that I had that I did a double collect there. That was fun. This thing, I think I'd like to clean that up a little bit because I think we should have methods for width and height. Um, I also like to, it's a style thing. I like to sort the methods alphabetically. So G coming before I should go first and then I and then N. So then like Height, H comes before I, right? So this is where we would put this. 
and then width down here. And this was um, making an assumption that all the rows are the same width. We just take the first row, right? So then we can just say that this is self dot width and height. And I used that one other place, didn't I? Like right here. Ah, uh, here I can just do self dot right okay and then um this indentation is sort of distressing so i wonder if we could just make this a method of self also Maybe, um, so this is gears. What if we just made a function called gear? That uh, we give it x, y, and the character. Actually, we don't even need to give it the character, right? Um, why don't we just give it anyway, because it's convenient. And then this is just the inner of this, right? So, um, uh, if I made this a tuple, and no, I still have self. Okay, well, we're, we're keeping the function object, but I'm just gonna move all this out and put it in here. And then say that this is self gear x, y, c. This is returning an option u32, right? So this should just be, um, oh, th we, we should dereference that. So I don't have to dereference it here. Okay, and then, because um, that already uses self, it just uses the coordinates and the, and the character. Right. So then this, it, it kind of, Prettys this up a little bit. It's not necessary, but we can make this a separate function called like enumerate grid or something, right? Why don't I just do that? Function enumerate. Enumerate cares. Um, self. And we get back at some iterator where the item is a uh, tuple, which is a uh, u size, u size. And uh, can I do the dereferencing too? I can, can't I? I that would make it sort of. Um, and then I have to add um, the lifetime of that borrow in there. Uh, but yeah, the whole point is to take this and just call it enumerate cares. And then if I dereference there, that works, right? Yeah, and so then so we're just basically given a name. For, given a name to that. So we just say enumerate cares and then filter map. And I don't need this dereference. All right. Yeah, it's too bad that we need to do this. Do I even need the move there? I don't think I need the move anymore. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, we still need the function object because we have the self dot. If it wasn't for that, then I could just do like self colon colon gear there. <laughs> but this does do an inner self borrow. 
trying to do this with Nam was a mistake. Oh no, Stripe Monkey. Are you still are you still working on it or did you finish it? Did you beat me at least? I did part one thirty four minutes and part two just over an hour. Kind of like my times from yesterday, only uh, I didn't start late. I started on time. Oh, when I was saying in Discord, I wanted, wanted to look at other people's solutions. So, Stripe Monkey uh, and Silmeth and uh, someone else, I think, also had solutions from previous days that I kind of wanted to look at, compare with mine. Okay, can I make this better somehow? Can I do a... Can I turn a Boolean into an option by doing a map? I'm not used to it, but I think there is something that you can do that, right? It's on this sheet somewhere, I thought. I could be wrong. Yeah, what if I just say like that dot map? Because this thing is a Boolean, right? That's a Boolean, bool. It would be cool if I could do like turn that into an option by doing a map, but I don't think there is such a thing, right? There's no method for bool that you can. Yeah. Undo enough to get back to where I was. Okay. Yeah, I'm grasping for something where I can get rid of this structural nonsense right i really want to just say do that make that call and if it's true then return the number otherwise don't return anything actually um we're doing number grid twice why don't i just make that the, the job of adjacent and then it's not adjacent anymore because this really is only called once, right? Or you know what I can do as I can have another function. I can just I can just say um in addition to adjacent, we have function um number if adjacent. I'm going to need to copy all that stuff, though. I don't know. This is sort of contrived. This is a bit contrived, but that's okay. Because at least we're making it a function. So this is self, right? And this is just width and height. So then I really can just say number if adjacent and then actually, yeah, I was going to say I can even get rid of that, but I don't think I can. So you can only put a function in here if it takes one thing and I can't because there are five things. But that's good enough, right? What would be really cool is if we could combine this with this and not collect into the vector at all. If we were smart about this and we were enumerating, we could say we could be collecting the product, but when we get to the third one, we could just 
shortcut return out. And if we didn't, and if we only had one thing, we would say, well, we only got one, so um, just just a drop, the first one we had. Could I do like a fold where we count the number of things along with the product, and then inside we would just short circuit out if the count goes greater than two. And then we then we would just say if total is two, return it. Right? You know what I'm saying? So we would say let um count and product equals self the number so if, so we don't collect it all what we do is um we would enumerate and then we would um fold how do how do we like end early is that what trifold does i'm not very good using trifold but something in the back of my mind says look up trifold trifold as long as it returns successfully yeah so what we can do is we can have it return um so try is something that returns returns a um it could be an option or a, or a result right so we can have it use option we can just have it return none if the count is above two right so can i do a trifold it just has to be a function that returns something that supports try with an output that's the same as our initial is initializer so the initializer would be uh, zero and one and we would get that as um, count and product along with the um, actually I guess I don't need enumerate do I we just get the next um, number in grid right this already mapped it to the number right we already got the number so we just get the um number i hate how it outdents that one inappropriately so the idea is that we do that and we say only if count is two do we have some product okay and then here we would say um Can I do like a mute here and then say count plus equal one? If count is greater than two, none. Actually, I kind of like having the sum be first. How about if count is less than or equal to two? then it's sum and then we would do count I guess we don't even need to do a plus one there we could just say if it's zero or one then it's count plus one and then product times number right Oh, this ends up getting, what is this getting? It gets an option out. Oh. So then it would just be an if let, right? Um, let's have this do an early return of sum, so I can just do that and then get rid of the else like that. So it has to be exactly two. We return, we, we, it becomes a none if, um, 
so this doesn't need to be mutable. It returns a none if we get three or more. If it's just one, we'll, we might get something, and we have to have this check. So it's either going to be one or two. Actually, it could be zero. It could be zero, one, or two, and we only accept two. If it's three or more, we end early, and we didn't need to collect because we did the product as we were iterating. Uh, I can just do cargo next test run. Make sure they didn't break anything. Hey, look, it didn't break it. Cool. All right, is that any better? There's no collect. It's got, it's a little uglier because of the fact that instead of using the product function, we had to do our own fold with the try so that we, but the try was important because that allows us to end early if there are too many arguments or too many numbers. And it's a little bit uglier because we have to, we have to hold on to the count to double check it at the end. Um, this could actually be folded together, right? I can do an if let sum two return. I can do this, right? In fact, I can do, can't I just do a, and then? Well, no. Is this too bizarre? That'll work though, right? Yeah, that still works. But is so that got rid of the extra if cuz I'm making I'm taking advantage of the fact that I can put any pattern here including constants. Good morning, Betsig. 635500. I am 37 14 43 97. But you probably challenged yourself more, right? And used a language that you're learning or something? Finally got under 2K? Who did? I didn't. <laughs> How did you get under 2K? Oh, Sweet Radish. You're not Betsy. You, you, color on your name is the same, but you're not the same person. Uh, how'd you get, how, what, what score did you get, Sweet Radish? Congrats on getting under 2K. That's hard to do. My my hat my virtual hat is off. Did not use Rust. You changed three parsing libraries, right? Yeah, I'm n I'm never going to um, get a high rank. I'm too slow. I'm just trying to clean up my solution now. I'm taking too much time typing Java. I take too much time like reading the problem, and I I don't prepare, and I type slow on this keyboard. This like looks too wordy. I'd like to make that better. Can I make like Can I make a specialized um iterator wrapper that does this for me? Like it should be like fold on fold up to twice. Fold up to twice, right? So only if the count is less than or equal to 1. In the end, we don't. We only use the count out out here, but that because hmm. I could have had um another um and then. Actually, yeah. Then I can get rid of this if, right? Yeah. Can't I do like an and then? Um, and we get account and um, product. Well, I'm just going to end up putting the if inside of here, but that's probably okay, right? Or is it, um, can I do a filter? Filter map? Does filter map work with an option? No, it's an and then, right? Ultimately, don't I still have to do an if? Like this. 
but at least then I can get rid of this outer if and this redundant stuff there, right? And then the whole thing gets outdented. Uh, self got deleted by accident. Yeah. That looks a little bit more appealing to me, but that doesn't break anything, right? Cool. Actually, I should, in addition to doing that, I should run make sure I get the same answer to um, part three that I always did have gotten. Yes. Okay. So now it's purely functional. There's some appeal to that vertic verticality, right? And and there's one less indentation of the whole thing, right? So we iterate the numbers. We're filtering out the ones that are non-adjacent to to um, to the symbol, and then we're folding up to two numbers and taking their product and then only if it's two do we return it. Standard lib scan FMT nom. You're using nom? You're up to ninth in your personal leaderboard. You were eleventh yesterday. Am I on your personal leaderboard? You're on my personal leaderboard. I think. I'm catching up on you. I'm only four away. <laughs> How do you like these times, though? Five minutes to do both stars. It's crazy. Okay, I think I've beaten this one to death. This is... Really, it should be gear ratio, right? Given a position and the character. And it's awesome because the gear, gear ratio is only present if there's a gear there. I mean, that's fine. I have a, I have a wicked state machine here for um, getting the numbers out of my grid. There's probably a more sophisticated way to extract the uh, numbers out of these grids. But what I did is I did a left to right scan and I had a state machine with an enumerated type where we're um, our state is either there's no number or is a number and we remember the starting position so that when we get to the end we can recognize a number and then one f one problem with the state machine is that termination state has is has to be sep handled separately the other way we could do it is we could chain something to this iterator to chain like an extra character or something and actually maybe that would not be a bad idea here um, because I could just chain a dot, right? That would be fine. Let's try that. Let's chain um a standard iter once, and then I just put in um here it would be a width and a dot. I have to pre-compute width though. Let width equal um. Uh, wait a second. It's line dot um, length. And I misspelled it. So then I don't need this thing, right? With that clever little chain there. And I don't need this, I don't need the state at all. That should not break anything. Look how clever I am. I just like remove that extra state at the end by synthesizing an extra character off to the right hand side. State machine, yeah. You just use nom to stop parsing once it hits a non digit character. 
Well, but this is my this is my parser. Is your non parser smaller than this? This is only twenty twenty lines of code. DFA is so clean. What's DFA? Discrete finite automata. I think this chaining with the with the once with the extra character in the end is clever. Because then I didn't have to repeat this push at the end. So what this does is if we're in this number state, we're guaranteed to get out of it because if we put an extra dot at the end, the dot is not numeric. So we if we're if we're always going to go into this at the very end. And if we're not in the number state, um we just end up doing nothing anyway, so no big deal. Filter map. Okay, so this we could have um, done like number if part is part is part number, then get is part number. What if we just say part number? What if we just say part number and it returns an option U32 and then here we return some number in grid number. Here we return none. And then it's a lot easier because then I can just say part number, grid part number. Isn't that better? I think so. Why two states for no number? What do you mean? There's only one state for no number. You mean why two matches? Um, because there are two possible possible um, next states for no number. So if you're in the no number state and you hit a number, now you're in the number state. But if you're in the no number state and you don't hit a number, you stay in the no number state. I can't combine any of these arms because the output or outputs are all different, right? Well, except for these two are, are the same, but then this one doesn't have the same side effect. I mean, I guess I could have combined this arm with this arm by putting this in a condition saying only if the state was number do we push a number. I think this is I think this is easier to understand. It's already kind of confusing when you do a match on a tuple. Um I like that I could do a autofill arms and it typed all that for me. All I really needed to do is type in the right hand sides of the arrows. I'm happy with this now. I'm happy. I like that the that the parts are very short functions, and um, as opposed to in previous years where the parts were really complicated, I ended up doing a lot of refactoring after the puzzle was done. It's increasing the odds of um, reuse of these functions. I don't think I did much reuse though, right? The only thing I reused was the grid new, right? This one used um, part number. This one used gears. So there's very little reuse between part ones and part two other than the, the grid parsing. But that that did buy me some time on part two. So I'm not complaining. Well, 190 lines of code for day two. How many for day, day three? How many for day two? Nine, 99. So are we increasing day to day? Yes, so day one was 85 lines, day two is 99 lines, day three is 190 lines. So we're getting more and more complex as we go. Can I recap that stretch mix? You mean the solution? For day three? So part one, we're given this grid. Now we're asked to find the numbers that are adjacent to a symbol and um, add them up. So it's basically every number except for 114 
and 58 because they're not adjacent to any symbol. So all these numbers are added up except for those two. Would you recommend AOC to beginner coders? I Well, there's two aspects of AOC. There's the coding aspect and then there's the problem solving aspect. So we're really doing two things. It's hard when you're learning to do more than one thing at a time. So I would say if you're a beginner coder, but you're good at solving problems, yes. If you're both a beginner coder and a beginner problem solver, then no, because now you're gonna be struggling doing two things at once, solving a problem and coding. And if you're trying to, if you're a beginner on both, you're gonna suffer. <laughs> 2022 D5 is much easier than this year's D3. The, I've noticed that the that the difficulty goes up and down every year, and I think it's just really tough as a problem designer to make problems that have difficulties that are equivalent from one problem to another. I think it it varies by like a problem that's hard for one person might be easier for someone else. And so if Eric is making these puzzles and he has like some beta testers who, who try to rank the problems by difficulty and those beta testers happen to like find some problems easier or harder, like in a different way than we do, we're going to perceive them as like not really matching year to year. And that's just because of sampling errors, like, and like how difficulty varies by the person. But yeah, see, like, I think I've been a code is more of a problem solving challenge, not a coding challenge. The coding part is secondary. If you could solve this problem in your head and you can think of the algorithm, the coding is really just the mechanical part of like translating your solution to the computer to execute it. Um, I don't really see it as a coding challenge. It's more of like a, a problem solving challenge. Um, that said, like if you if if you're if you're okay problem doing problem solving and you're in your you're learning how to to do, to code, this would be a good and fun way to practice coding skills because um, that mechanical part of translating the solution in your head to the code that the machine will run to execute your your algorithm is a good exercise in whatever you're learning to code. It's easier if you've seen leak code number of violence. This is sort of like in the same kind of category as leak code problems, right? Because leak code is also about problem solving. You have a recommendation for beginner problem solver. Um, I would say Evan, a code is okay for that if you're good. If you're if you're a good coder, see, it's the same thing, right? If there are two things and you're good at one. Then this is a, then Evan a code is a great thing for learning the other. So if you're a good coder, not so good with problem solving, use Evan a code. If you're good at problem solving, not a good coder, also do Evan a code. If you're if you're good at both, you'll probably be bored. If you're beginning in both, you'll probably find it too hard. <laughs> um, something else that would be good for a beginning problem solver probably Leap Code, because Leap Code will also give you um, a choice, like a menu of problems based off of curated difficulty levels. So you would start with like the, the easy problems on Leap Code. And after you get a hang of it and you start to learn like different problem solving techniques, then you move on to the me the moderate and the difficult level problems. Um, problem solving on itself without coding, that's a tough one. I guess you'd have to pick a domain, like what kind of puzzle or what kind of problem. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know. <laughs> okay, I think I'm done. Oh, uh, two one, two things I wanted to do before I, before I call it an, a night for this. Um, I want to look at other people's solutions, and I also wanted to see if I could make this into a macro, which would be kind of fun, right? I think 
that when we get towards day 20, this is going to look really, really redundant, right? Because it's exactly the same format for every day and every part. So wouldn't it be nifty if we could do have this gener be generated by a macro, right? Uh, so let's try to make a macro. I forget how to do this, so I'm going to look it up. Rust macro. Macros, here we go. So we want to do a macro rules. And we do um, the name of the macro. So like, um, I don't know what we want to call it. Solve. Okay, and then we put symbols in there, right? Am I going to be able to do this with a uh, this kind of macro? Basically, I want to take these numbers and put them and glue them to the letters P A R T and D A Y, and also put the put it in a string. Glue them together and form new tokens. Am I going to be able to do that with a with a Rust macro? Can we glue tokens together with expressions? Or will I really will, will I need to do a procedural macro? What's that homepage? It's just a HTML that I made for myself. It has uh, just like quick links. I got the idea on how to do this from Adam. So shout out to Adam. He inspired me to make my browser homepage just a bunch of uh, links to things I commonly want to go to first. So whether it's Google or ChatGPT or Rust libraries or turning my LED lights on and off or, you know, different projects I'm working on. It's just a convenient way, like, instead of having bookmarks. Yeah, it's like a fancier bookmarks bar. But it's something that I can, like, I can't edit it here because I don't have it in my virtual machine. Actually, maybe I do. Maybe I do. Did I put it in here? I did. Here it is. So it's just a simple HTML with all of my uh, links in it. And I just, uh, you know, most browsers, you can, you can point your homepage to a file colon slash 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 path. I just have it point to wherever I store this HTML page on my computer. I don't know if I can make a macro rules thing to do what I want here because I need to take a number and glue it to another, like a partial symbol to form a new symbol. I don't know if that's something you can do with the, with a macro rules macro. I might have to do with this harder to do thing called the procedural macro. Um, can I, maybe I can ask find, what am I stuck on in rust? How do you write a macro that generates an identifier formed by gluing two partial identifiers together as in one is a as an argument to the macro and part is built into the macro producing an identifier part one giving it enough context here, asking the AI. You can use the concat idents macro to concatenate two identifiers. However, it's important to note the concat idents is unstable and not recommended in production codes, only available nightly. Okay.
what's this doing? I think it's not, this here is sort of not really understanding what I want. But maybe I can look up concat idents. Any comma separate identifiers? I need something to one yielding expression, which is a new identifier. Okay. It's too bad that it's nightly only, though. Huh. That's exactly what I want, though, right? Because I have a function called part one, and I want to, like, take the word part and one and glue them together and have, 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 it, have it emit code that calls part one. Variable, variable names. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. So maybe I punt on this for now. But you, you guys see what I'm trying to do, right? I, I don't want to have to write all this. Like, I'm copy-pasting this every day. I'd like to just have it written once in a macro and then just have one line for every day. In fact, it would be really cool if we could just have a loop. Or we could have a first day, last day, and then have the macro loop right and generate match arms for every day um, that calls every day and every part of every day um, and it just incremented the day, the day number every day <laughs> php yeah if only we were doing php not rust right okay um i think instead i'm gonna take a look at my discord and see the Advent to Code channel. I'm scrolling back. So Stripe Monkey has solutions to their Advent of Code. So I'm going to look at that. And compare with mine. So here's Stripe Monkey, who's maybe still in chat. And they have their year 20, 30, 23. And let's compare. So here's my day one. Let's compare it to their day one. So my day one. All uh, right. We had to do um, taking a bunch of words and filtering them. And we had to like find, we were basically matching our input to some words. And then finding the first and last and adding them together. All that good stuff. So... How did Stripe Monkey do it? Wait, what? I don't understand. Where is the solution? <laughs> is it in bin? Okay, here it is. All right. So part one was easier, right? Part one was just taking the first digit and last digit. So line characters find map and um, reverse find map and then parsing them um, and then um, the, the two digit did the parsing really, right? Um, and then mult um, Forming them together by multiplying the first by 10 and adding the second. Whoa. What did I just do? Um, I don't know what I just did. I entered full screen mode some, somehow. <laughs> that was weird. Okay. I don't know what key combination I did for that. Oh, you misspelled process, my friend. Okay, but this is the same thing I did, right? Only, okay, so I did is, I did, uh, I did two digit. You did, so this is what I started with. I, I remember starting with is numeric and then, and then doing two digit later. 
Um, but you stuck with is numeric. And then you did a two digit. Okay, so that's pretty s close to what I did, only it's an interesting way to do it, though. I'm wondering why you um, bothered to do this rather than just unwrapping. So if you had unwrapped both of these, you wouldn't have needed to do the match because they would have just been, you could have just done this directly. An unwrap would have done the equivalent of the panic. Okay. Um, oh, I see. Your implementation of the part one is actually built into the assert. Huh. Okay. That's part two. Okay, so you did the same thing I did, only you did not have the number encoded in the map. I guess you just took the position. Oh, you even have a zero. We didn't have to do zero. It wasn't in the list, but you put it in there anyway. That's fine. So you just probably took advantage of the index of, in, of it, right? Min by key, min by key. How come when I click there, it, I just want to select that. Min by key, what does that do? I don't know. Something I don't know. Yeah, see, this is using the index, right? Match indices. Yeah, you're enumerating the um, the sl slice. Interesting, you have, this is what I consider old school Rust where you borrow, you have a, a borrow of something. I just did a, a straight on array. I guess in this way, you didn't have to encode the size like I did. I had to encode the size. But otherwise it's the same, except for I put in the number explicitly and used the used enumerate with an index. Or I used an encoded index and used the, the enumeration, the, the position as the as the, the mapping. Okay. So you have find alpha and find numeric and then where, where do you combine them together? Oh, here, here you combine them. Oh, that's interesting. Matched by? Reverse? I don't know what that is. Oh, is that a wrapper? F is that is that the generic wrapper for reversing an iterator? Matched by. Okay, Stripe Monkey, I think you over-engineered it. <laughs> you have a generic with with three lines of constraints. <laughs> Gotta hand it to you though. Um, that's some engineering. Yeah, I'm 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 having trouble even reading it. Sorry. <laughs> Let's move on to day two. Since I think you have both day one and day two in here, right? Yep. All right. Day two. So what did my day two look like? My day two right. I remember we were playing games by pulling 
red, green, and blue cubes out of a bag, right? And we had certain rules. So the first one was that we had to find out, like, we had to... We are parsing in games, and we were seeing if the games were legal, and we were counting the number of them, right? Actually, we were, we were summing the IDs of the legal games, yes. Part two, we were just... Um, we were computing, we were taking each game and we didn't care if it was legal or not. We were taking, we were computing what was considered the power of the game, which was um, taking the maximum of the red, maximum of the green, maximum of the blue, and, and multiplying them all together. So maybe product would have been a better word than power. I don't forget why I called it power. Maybe the instructions called it power. So we were taking the, 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 inner maximums of red, green, and blue, multiplying them together. And then um, those products we were then summing. So let's see how Stripe Monkey did it. Bin part one. So this is, again, the legality ones, right? So filter by pot, so we call a possible game, max RGB, then map it. Uh, why didn't you use filter map, my friend? I've I've started to learn that. At first, I was uncomfortable doing it, but filter and map is just filter map, right? It would be if game possible game max RGB, then some game n, otherwise none. And possible game could return that, right? Uh, looks like you have game in a different file somewhere, so we're gonna have to look at that. Why am I not seeing game? Is it in lib? Aha. Uh -huh. You have it here. Interesting. You have a tuple? What did I do for mine? I had a vector of rounds one dimension. You had a two dimensional vector of numbers with slices. Looks like I didn't retain anything from the input. I have just the red, green, blue values and I have a vector of that. And you retained, I'm not sure what this number is, but you retained a, 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 a slice of the original input, looks like. Tag. Oh, is this the nom stuff? Yep using nom, so we're parsing, we're parsing using nom, right? Okay, so we get, we're throwing away the game, we get the n right after the game, and then we're throwing away that stuff, and then we're getting the different rounds. Okay, so this is, the equivalent of that for me was around here somewhere. Right here, I did a split once, strip prefix, split, and then a from in round does splitting by the comma and then splitting once on space and parsing and then matching the name to the right field. Okay. So it's going to look a lot different because of the fact that you're using nom, but this is similar. So that match is the same as my match over here. So I did a builder thing where I had a this and then I just like, so what did you do differently? Okay, so you just had them as separate fields and then, okay, and then you, okay, so whereas I had a struct, you just had a tuple. And how does that get fed back in? They don't see it anywhere here. Maybe that's there. I don't see how round RGB gets called. Oh, here it is. Oh, so you do the parsing at this point. Huh, interesting.
Okay, I mean, it's just a different way of doing it. Nothing good or bad about it. Uh, okay, let's look at part two. Part two leveraged part one and okay, so it's just the lower RGB power. Lower RGB power. Lower RGB bound. Okay, so th here we go. So that compared to what I had to do here. So I had the similar kind of fold, only I had it in a struct and you just had it as a tuple. Um, and then you did a, you did a destructured, but you still did the same kind of max that I did. You just destructured the two things and then restructured it as a tuple. Okay. Cool. All right. Okay, I hesitate to do this, but because this, I don't think it's in Rust, but Silmith also has solutions. Oh no, they are in Rust. I thought they weren't. All right, now we're looking at Silmith's solutions. I don't know if Silmith's in chat. Maybe Silmith is watching on YouTube later. I don't know. Oh, that's clever. So I had a table and I, at runtime, manually compared each one, but a match would have been smarter to do. Okay, I should have thought about that. Ooh, regex. Wait, why have a regex and a match? I don't, is, are they independent? Kind of looks like it. The string to digits not called by this, right? Huh. Wait. I don't see the, um, the, oh, so this is lacking tests. This is just reading from standard input. So you have to feed it the input on your standard input device. Got it. Okay. The string to digits not called though. I don't, oh no, it's called right here. Then digits. Oh, so the digits next is using the regular expression, but it's returning just a slice. So, okay. So there's a little bit of redundancy right here, right? You have the same symbols in two places. It would be cool if you had somehow com com combined the two together and had the item be a um, U32. Yeah, I wonder why that couldn't be done. Is that because, I suppose that's because it's hard with this re to do both a regex and a conversion to an index at the same time. <laughs> yeah, okay. And that's just day one. Do we have a day two? Okay. <laughs> okay, there's the rules stuff that I remember having that. Right here. Oh, here's a map with another map inside.
a map with an and then inside. Okay, this same reduces what I had as a fold right here. So as we all know, a fold and a reduce are roughly equivalent. And I think I remember writing this and at one point we were saying, well, this could be reduced and then we don't need this empty. But then we'd have to check if there was at least one where a fold, you don't need to do that. So it was just like a trade trade off. Okay, so Silmeth and Stripe Monkey you did similar things. They they did um the parsing by um more like um by more scanning left to right rather than doing a splitting like I did. Expect. So what is expect? Oh, actually it's a, it's it is with strip so there's a strip prefix. So I use strip prefix also, but I did a split first. So I guess it doesn't really matter which way you do it. You could s split and then strip the prefix, or you could strip the prefix and then and then split, <laughs> or then 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 just um, then just parse. And then yeah, expect is just okay. So it's more left to right and less breaking up in the middle. Okay, cool. I think I'm done looking at other solutions. So I will see you guys in about 21 hours and 40 minutes. Let's see. Is anyone else still working on Advent of Code we can go look at? It looks like no. No one else is doing Advent of Code. Really? Not a single person? How about if I browse to the category? Um, browse to software and game development. Time Enjoyed is doing Avanta Code. Let's go raid Time Enjoyed. All right. More Avanta Code on your way with Time Enjoyed. I will see you guys in 21 hours and 40, 40 minutes or so. Have fun. Bye.